This is a production of Cornell University. All right, let me tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things that have been going on in the industry. Who here thinks the industry is anything like it was in 2007? I think we all know it's changed quite a bit. First of all, the recession had a huge impact. We all know that, generally speaking, our industry is somewhat immune to recessions. People still own their homes. People still want to invest in their homes. They may cancel going out to dinner or, or a nicer vacation, but they continue investing in their homes. This one was different. I think we all know why. I'm not going to dwell too long on this. But with so many people losing their homes, our industry was deeply impacted. There was no new buildings you know, going up. There's no new homes going up. And therefore, the, the demand for, for plants was starting to die off. And I would say a good number of people went out of business in that time period. Also, garden retailers are retiring in huge numbers. You know, I don't know what was going on in the 70s and 80s, but it was like a baby boom for garden retail. How many people in here are garden retailers, or a handful of you? How many here are less than 55 years old who own a garden center? <laughs> who own a garden center? So we have one. So it's, you know, if, you, uh, if you're serving garden retail, or if you're someone who own it yourself, the ownership is going through a huge, huge change. Because everybody wants to retire. Consumers are, re are, are changing, and that's no big secret there at all. And I'm going to go into each one of these a little bit more deeply here in a moment. And, oops, sorry guys. Plant retail is moving away from the term garden centers. The word gardening is beginning to not be all that popular. All right, so owners are retiring. So what happens when they retire? About a third of them have family members or employees who are buying or inheriting the, the business. Hopefully, you're selling the business and the land. In order to sell the business, and this is kind of, this is where the timing is really, really poor, with the 2008 recession, if you were not making a profit for the last three years, it's very difficult to sell your business. You know, you're selling the inventory and you're selling the land you're, you're sitting on. So hopefully these people have been able to turn it around before they retire and able to sell the business. All right, so if you are selling your, um, if you're not able to sell your business, hopefully you're able to sell the land, if you own the land, if you're not leasing it. If you, you sell the land and the inventory, if you don't have a profit. And you work until you can't anymore. That's your other option, if you can't sell anything. A lot of retailers I know who are looking to retire, they have like a five-year selling plan. They go ahead and quietly put their business up for sale so they can have several years to sell it. It's not like selling a house. It's a very different business. So if you are supplying plants to people who have a retail business, keep that in mind because that's a very different mindset for those who are, you know, they're not necessarily reinvesting in their company unless they're trying to sell it or they have someone else to pass it on to. So that's going to be a challenge for you. Now, at the same time, garden, plant retail is not just plant retail anymore. Hold on, I'm trying to get this out of my hands here a moment. It's not going to be pretty, but there we go. All right, so it's not just plant retail anymore. A lot of retailers are going into having services, and this isn't just landscape. I'm not talking about the traditional landscape services. I'm talking about going to a customer's home and doing a sketch of a layout for them. So landscape extremely light. Or it might be going in and changing out patio pots for them or putting up Christmas decorations. Their product mix is changing. The types of plants that they're selling. You know, obviously annuals are still keying, but we, we track that every year. We ask retailers about how their plant sales are going. And annuals and perennials are still keying, but shrubs and trees and the large perennials and a lot of those things have been quiet. This year's different. This year's different. We've been hearing good news about the larger plants, but for the past several years, they've been going down. And food and garden is, are blending. I know a lot of retailers who are actually starting to host farmer's markets at their center. They're either giving space to people who have farmer's markets, or they're actually becoming the farmer market, farm market um, managers for it, or they're hosting CSAs. 
and they're also selling a lot of food plants and edibles and also produce themselves. So you're beginning to see kind of this blend of the farm market and the garden center. And this is happening more on the garden retail side than it is on the farm market side. You're not seeing as many plants going into farm markets as you are produce going into farm, uh, greenhouse, uh, garden centers. And they're beginning to act as a community hub. You know, they have, especially in the wintertime when they have all that space underneath the greenhouse, uh, I'm seeing more and more garden centers that are either leasing or donating the space they have. So this is where the Lions Club meets, and this is where sometimes town councils have their meetings, where they have community get-togethers. You know, there's a lot of auctions that begin happening so that they're able to use that space when it's not, having, not full of plants. All of these things are going to impact how, how we're selling plants. You could see the traditional model of what we're doing isn't at all what it used to be. And they're setting up shop where consumers are. So you're beginning to see the pop-ups that are coming around, but they aren't just on the corner of a busy street anymore. You're seeing them in the farmer's markets. You're seeing them uh, like a little stand outside the popular craft beer you know, location and that type of thing. You're beginning to see them at festivals. So where the consumers are is drawing retail there. That's a very small footprint, generally speaking. All right, so consumers are changing. Let me give you a little background here on this section here. Who's he, who here is tired of hearing about millennials and how they behave? <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> yeah. I have been working with uh, Bridget Behe with Michigan State and uh, Susan Hogan with Emory University. Well, she was with Emory University a year ago. She got lured away by Deloitte and Touche for a very big salary. But for the past three years, since 2013, we have been doing consumer research. And what we wanted to know, well, what we really wanted to do is only slightly ambitious. We want to figure out how we can expand the number of people who garden. Not at all ambitious. Um, and so what we started looking at, we wanted to know what are the barriers. We wanted to um, find out why, what people think about garden centers. What do they think about gardening? What do they think about plants in their own yards and their lifestyles? And then we also wanted to figure out what kind of marketing messages, so stage two was to go to the PR type people and the advertising firms. And then stage three was then to recruit real world garden centers to implement these marketing messages and see how they went. So what I'm gonna go over here is gonna be about the research we had done and what we found out. We decided to look at those who are under 50 for our research for a very good reason. Bridget B. He has been looking at consumers for a long time. Those who are over 50, if they're not gardening, they have a very good reason why they're not gardening anymore. They've moved into a condo. They've tried it, they hate it. You know, we're not gonna be able to convert that group as much. So our goal was to expand people who garden, which means we need to get those who are more ignorant about gardening or have not tried it or just beginning to, to think about it. So that's why we chose this group. So what we did is we had, um, we did focus groups. We've done this in three different locations. One was in Atlanta, one was in Ohio, and right now we're working in the Toronto area. And we've been working with, in Ohio and Toronto, we've worked with two different grants along with that as well. Uh, Flowers Canada, then the USDA, they're the Department of Ag in Ohio. So we had three days of, of, of focus groups where we had those, we wanted to find out what the pipeline was doing. These are not the people we necessarily think are gonna be our customers right now, but we looked at the 18 to 29 year olds. We then looked at the 30 to, 40, um, 30 to 49 year olds, which is our sweet spot. And then we also looked at parents who had children between the ages of two and 12, because that's a whole different dynamic all on its own. And we had three days of questions for each of those groups. And we wanted at least 20 participants in each group which means if you wanted them there by the third day, you started the first day with you know, a lot more. So on average, we had more than 100 people on each year of study. So here are some of the things we found. So this is the uh, first, this is Ohio's key findings. We find out that the act of gardening has mostly positive impression. So I'm starting positive here. You know, they think of it as outdoors and beautiful and healthy, and, and so we do have that reputation. Good news. Consumers have distinct ideas of who gardens, and it's that lady right there. And they don't see themselves as that lady right there. They think she has to have tons of time, and here's a very key part. She has to be expert. She has to know what she's doing, and even people who like to garden think they're stupid about it. They don't feel expert, so that's a problem. 
and it's a very and if it's that limiting, then they're not going to associate themselves with that hobby. And that's where the term gardening has a problem. Garden centers are the third most popular place to buy plants. Grocery stores and mass merchants are the most popular. And they will drive by a independent. And what was interesting, the first time we did a focus group was in Atlanta, um, where, where Home Depot is headquartered. And what we were being told is that if you go into a garden retail, somebody who's an expert in that, it's intimidating. I don't want to feel stupid. And if I go in there and they know more than I do, and they know I know more than, they know more than I do, then I feel humiliated. There's this sense of being caught being stupid, and nobody wants to feel that way. So they would rather go to Home Depot where they know the employees might or might not know, but at least they're not stupid in comparison to them. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's something we have to overcome. That's a barrier. <laughs> and consumers lack, this, was, this one was really interesting. This fourth finding, you know, we had the three days of questions. That's a lot of questions we're asking. We didn't ask one question in this field. This became a key finding because we heard the word luck and risk over and over and over again from every, all three groups and related to all these different questions over three days. So, like one person said, I knew I shouldn't buy that rose. It was so beautiful. I, I, I knew I was going to kill it, but I bought it anyway. And I was so lucky it survived. You know, it's just there, there's a sense that if you buy a plant, you have no impact on if it succeeds, if it lives or dies. It's almost like they're expecting, you know, like they think of gardening um, like someone going to cook and haven't, don't have a recipe and they decided to throw everything into a pot and hope it comes out tasty. <laughs> you know, th there's a sense that we don't need recipes. You know, there's a sense we have no control over how it happens. And so, you know, we, that's, that's a major problem. That's why gardening is not the number one hobby anymore. You know, so that, that's a big one. This is what we learned last year and this past year. It's uncomfortable feeling ignorant, which is, not this, two different groups, these are two totally different, you know, one's in Ohio, one's in Canada, and we also had the ones in Atlanta. We heard this again and again. Yes? Yes? On the previous slide, are number two and three related? In other words, did the consumers over time develop the idea that they don't know how to garden, and therefore they feel uncomfortable coming to a garden center? Yeah, I think that's incredibly insightful. He's saying this for those of you who didn't hear. He's, he wonders if two, uh, three and four, is that right, or two and three? Two and three, two and three are interrelated. So they have a distinct idea who gardens, and then garden centers. I think it is very much that. Uh, they, they, I had several people tell me in Atlanta, because uh, those were the ones I actually sat in on. The other ones, we, we made sure we weren't in the room other than to moderate questions, you know, people come to us. So we're trying to make sure it's as unintimidating a process as possible. But I heard several people say that um, I will go to a garden center when, once I'm an expert, but I'm not an expert yet. So, yeah. You're going to follow up a question? Yeah. I had a couple young 20-somethings come in separately and ask me, you know, tell me how to grow uh, uh, vegetables in a container, something like this. So, some, somewhere in their upbringing, their parents didn't teach them how to garden. So now we have a disconnect in a sense of how people relate to plants and how they're able to take care of them and an increasing likelihood that they are unsuccessful with our product. Yeah. Is everybody familiar with the Brandeis? I think it's Brandeis, isn't it? That does the incoming freshman, kind of their world perspective? Right, right. So they'll say they've never been in a world where, you know, um, I don't know what the most recent stuff. Yeah, they, they've, always had, I, they've always had smartphones. They don't know what a, a CD is. You know, they, you know, they've never even heard of a B VCR. You know, so they kind of go through to try to give the pr professors a sense of the kind of world perspective. Well, think about that when it comes to gardening. You know, my grandparents were major gardeners. I was lucky enough that my mom loved to garden. But most people, most people do not have parents who garden. So they're at least two generations away. 
and I'm 50, by the way, so I'm on that cusp of between these, these two groups. So you get younger and younger generations, there, there's the whole disconnect of, of how they, um, of what gardening is and, and that type of thing. There's another problem, which I'm about to get to in a moment here. No one wants to feel ignorant, and if they feel ignorant, they're not, you know, there's a, a sense that they're not gonna even try, which leads to online research. It's a big deal. And this is funny, someone at dinner last night was talking about this. They're saying that, um, you know, people will come into the garden center saying, I, I'm so confused, I tried to look it up online. Have you ever tried to research things online? And I'm someone who, um, I'm a new homeowner, I've had a house for a year, and the element in my um, oven caught on fire, shorted out. And, you, and by the way, usual ways of putting out a fire doesn't work other than just turning off the oven. So um, I went online to find out, because I'm cheap, and I want to do an addition a little bit to uh, have a new kitchen, I didn't want to buy a new oven. So I went online and I saw a video on how to replace the element. That's what people do now, you know? But try to do that with gardening, it's not as easy. I mean, there's, there's, we're getting better and better. There's more out there than there used to be. But there's a lot of information and disinformation, and it's confusing. So what they'll do, they'll start online, but they want a trusted world, world person. That could be their aunt. Or they do know someone in the family who gardens, so they'll call them up now. Or they'll go into a garden center now and start asking questions. Okay. <laughs> so yes, online research is extremely important. That's where they start. But then they kind of get so far that they want to talk to someone who they think might know what they're talking about. And that's where we have a real opportunity. And food gardening is almost as common as flower gardening. Uh, Ian Baldwin is a consultant in the industry, and he's been uh, the, working with the National Gardening Association with their national survey they've been doing. They've been doing it since, I think, like 1970. And they look at food gardening not just for the vegetable plants and the herbs, which we know are not very high ticket or high margin products. They look at everything else that people buy when they do that type of gardening, which is a lot of stuff. They want to have, you know, as you mentioned, you have people who want to do vegetable gardens in containers, you know, so they're buying all of that garden media. They're buying the pots, which are usually big pots, because if you have a tomato, you can't have a little pot, you know, so they're, they're buying gloves and all these things, you know, they, they, this generation wants to look the part, so they're going to get their boots and their clogs and their, you know, they're going to get the hats and everything. They're going to be, they're going to be well equipped. That's a lot of money, and that's more associated with vegetable gardening than it is with flower gardening. Now, it hasn't completely overtaken it, but it's neck and neck. So don't underestimate that, that c category for yourself. <laughs> We've got a real problem. Think about when we have um, dinner parties. Where do people gather now? Kitchen island, you know? They used to be out in the dining room or if you had them outdoors. You know, when you have big, big parties, how often are they held in the backyard anymore? They're almost always held inside now, you know, because we don't want mosquitoes, we don't want the heat, we don't want the rain, you know. Only if the conditions are absolutely perfect and you had time to mow the grass and do the weeding and all that, do you, you see what I mean? That's all chores. Think about all of the, you know, one of the, if you think about how popular like on HGTV, you know, all the home decor stuff is, it's because people are inside all the time and they're looking going, you know, I'm kind of tired of the, you know, I think I need to restain that wall because you're looking at it all the time. And you begin thinking, you know, I don't like that blonde wood anymore. I want it to look a little, I want to give it a little pop. You, you begin, you know, that's just human nature. You want to begin tweaking stuff. If you're not outside, you're not thinking that way. If the only time you're going outside is to snow blow or you're going out to rake or you're going out to mow the lawn, it's annoying. And if you're only going outside to get it in your car, We've got a problem. People want to be outside, don't get me wrong, but they're going to hiking trails, they're going to the beach, they're going to outdoor, you know, their kids' sporting events. Outdoors to people now are not their backyard. So we've got to figure out in our marketing, you know, you're, the nature is at your doorstep. You know, we, we need to emphasize that nature is right there. Because if people are not going outside, all they're doing are chores. You know, has anyone ever done any home renovations? Do you know how freaking hard that is? I mean, my best friend and I decided to, um, she had this cute bungalow and they decided to, they had a big attic and they're gonna add a bedroom up there. So we took out the hall closet and I know it's all the rage now, but ship laugh, if you ever try to actually pull that sucker stuff, that stuff off. 
It was so much fun for like the first 15 minutes. <laughs> we had about four more days to go. So. But people are still focused on the end result. Gardening is nowhere near as hard as home decor. But we're so focused on the annoying part, you know, they're not looking at the end result because they're not outside enjoying it. <laughs> and this is the fun part. This is the part I like so much. People who absolutely hated gardening, who had no desire, was never going to do it, 100%, every single person said, children should be gardening. They need to get unplugged. They need to get away from all their computers and their games. They need to understand where food comes from. It's educational. Everybody thinks kids should be gardening. Yeah, yeah, except the kids. <laughs> that, I think, is a big vehicle to get people back into the garden retail, in the plant cells. <laughs> when you think about what, you know, this desire to get unplugged and get out of all the routine, because gardening is not as routine as, say, going to a sporting event and on ballet and everything is so, so structured. And people aren't quite ready to give that up because they still want them to get into Cornell and Harvard and that type of thing. But they do want them to have a little bit more instructor time. But it has to be educational. It has to be productive. So really think about the marketing that you can be doing. I remember I wrote an article a few years ago. <laughs> and this would not make sense at all today. And it wasn't that long ago. It was less than five years ago. And the question was, do we really want to have kids in the garden center? Because a lot of retailers w don't want kids coming to the garden center. All they do is they, well, they force the parents to be there for less than 20 minutes. Their attention span is so short. They mess things up. They climb on the stuff. And, and, and their parents never spend that much anyway, which actually, I'll show you in a little bit, they do. But um, if you don't bring them to the kids, you're not going to have sales pretty quickly. And this is where you get the adults in, because everybody thinks kids need to be in there. That was a cover story. You know? Yes? There's a garden center near me that has a scavenger hunt for the kids, and when they leave after they find their tomato plants and all of that, then they get a star, and they have them going to the Awesome. Places. I don't know if you guys heard that. She's saying there's a garden center near her, her that has a scavenger hunt for kids, and they have to go through the store, and when they they find their tomato plant or whatever it is, the prize that they get, they get a gold star when they leave. So that's awesome. So. All right. Now think about that mindset and think about what they would think walking into this. We got a perception problem. You walk in and it's a horizontal sea of green. It's intimidating. I don't know what even the difference between an annual and a perennial and I'm walking into this. I mean, this is actually pretty well done, I think. It's, you know, it's attractive. But if I am someone who doesn't know where to get started, yikes. I'm scared. How are we doing on time, by the way? Because I'm kind of... About 20 minutes. Okay, good. All right, so there is a solution to all this. I'm not someone who's to say, scared, scared, scared. I'm very much... I've, you've got to be able to figure out what we can do about it. So... My philosophy for like, my career is if I focus on who is reading, who is the audience, we can't go too far wrong. You know, we're going to follow them. And we might go make a misstep here or there, but if we get so stuck on ourselves thinking we know everything, we're going to not, we're, our numbers of people who are reading articles and everything, we're just going to plummet. We're going to crash and burn. The exact same thing is true for anyone who deals with the public, including garden centers. You know, we have to be thinking about who your customer is. And some of the things we've done, you know, one of the reasons we've been so specific about the locations is you have to understand the customer in that location. They aren't the same in Toronto as they are in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, there's some universal truths about human nature. But your community is your community. And so we worked with, <laughs> I worked with uh, Susan, Hogan, she was the professor from the MBA college, um, Goizeta School of Business, I think it's called, um, at Emory University in Atlanta. And we worked with a garden center in Massachusetts called Lakeview Nurseries. Anybody familiar with Lakeview? They've got a couple of locations in the Lunenburg area. And that's the staff. They're 
a fun bunch. And so we did this in May of 2012, April and May, and we decided we're gonna research her customers specifically. Those who are actually coming into the garden center. So we're looking at customers here. And she was going, oh, no, I, I already know my customers. I'm there every day. And I'm reading all the new reports that come out. And she is a very smart woman. You know, uh, I'm, let's see if I can see Michelle. Michelle is the second from the end there. I'm sure there's some way to do a pointer here. Oop, that's not it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm not going to play with this other than the forward and backward now. Um, maybe it's this one. There we go. That's Michelle right there, Michelle Harvey. And she owns it, and that's her husband. Um, her family owned it, and, she, and that's her husband, who's the finance guy on, the, on this team. So it's important to know what Richard Bursch, his name is Richard Bursch. Uh, he was a skeptic on all of the stuff we're doing beforehand. So um, she was sure she understood, because she's someone who really pays attention. She does a lot of really smart things. But we said, let's just take a look at who your customers are. So going in, she knew who her customer was. She was a 50 to 60 something female. And she was affluent and she loved gardening. So we decided to do three different types of research methods. How many people in here are researchers? Okay, I'm gonna be going over stuff you've heard. So we did the observational, which I call the Jane Goodall or more honestly, stalking. <laughs> Laddering, which is answering questions and uh, to asking basically like a three-year-old why. Why, 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 until you're getting to the emotional payoff of what caused something fairly normal. I'll get into that in a second. Oop. When it jumps forward, it jumps forward. And then we did a survey. So we went to watching what they're doing, then hyper-individual, and then we went to as broad as we could. So we did three different methods to try to figure it out. The observational method. You have to recruit people. So you're, basically what they're doing is they are watching people shop and they're taking notes. And so you have to find the right person. Rule number one, never have it be a male, ever. Because, and, and this is stereotyping, but women, we, most of us were raised to always be aware of who's around us and males are threats. Unless he's a really cute guy, but you're noticing him too. <laughs> So generally speaking, if you don't know a guy and, and you know if someone just happens to be going from department to department with you, you're always aware of that. I'm, I, I know I'm generalizing, but does anyone, every, any female in here think differently on that one? Generally, I mean, it's true enough that enough women are doing this that we are aware, we're, you know, I don't know about you, I was always taught to look in the back seat before I get in the car, so that first episode of Dexter when he strangled the guy in the front, you know, by jumping out of the back seat, it's like, yeah, that never would have happened with a woman. You know, we always look in the back seat. We're always aware of the fact that we could be easy victims because we're not as physically strong as men. You know, we're not, I'm not saying we're always victims, but we're always alert. So you never want to have a male do it. So what they ended up doing is they recruited two ladies who head up their garden um, clubs in the area and they shop at multiple stores. So they did not want them to be employees. That's another big important role. Your employees are recognized. And people are going to, they're going to be interrupted, they're going to be, they're going to be noticed as well. So they got two older ladies who shop at multiple stores who are going to be a little bit more fair. They're not going to say how incredible you are, that type of thing. And they work separately and they follow people all day long, two days on, you know, Saturday and Sunday, two weekends in a row. They wanted to, they selected the criteria of what they're going to observe. They had bought new, um, they're on a hilly location, so they had bought handbrakes on their carts. And they wanted to see, you know, basically, I'm sure they're looking and saying, hey, look how much more money we're getting because of these great carts we have now. We're not having to go down to the liquor store at the bottom of the hill to get our carts back. But they also wanted to see where in the store they went, how many people they talked to, what, you know, which departments they went to. They picked things up and put them back down. What they end up buying? Did they do thing, you know? Did they have impulse buy? They're also looking at general. They can guesstimate their age. Uh, they could, you know, if they're by themselves or they're with kids or a friend or a spouse, you know, they're they're making those type of observations and how long they were in the store. They did it for multiple days of observation, and they compiled the chart, um, the results in a chart. So, chart sample time in store. We've kind of gone the age and gender behavior. And they took notes, they had room if there's something unusual, they can make a note about that. So, 
here's an example of what we learned here. So we have this person, number one, is they're in the store 35 minutes. They're about in 30s. So there's a female with one child. Uh, primary path, they really wanted to see where they went. So we have the path there. She spoke with staff, yes. What were they, what was purchased? Window boxes, kid project, hummingbird feeder and perennials. Add-ons at checkout. She got that hummingbird feeder right there. And they seemed to pick up an item from every department. Staff worked with her to find plants and so on. So they did this with everybody. And what they found out, oops, sorry. So what they found out when they compiled all of this, their main customer was a 30-something couple. They were in a store about 20 minutes on average. You know, she was a little bit above average in her time there, and she actually spoke with a lot of people. Generally speaking, they didn't speak to people in their departments. They were there quickly because they had kids. They're there, like I said, that 20-minute time frame, but they piled a lot of stuff in that short time period. Now, the next and most important group was that 50-something female, but they were there on average 45 minutes, and they spoke with people in their de each department. That makes a big difference in how you're marketing. So the next one, and we're short on time. I would normally bring someone up here and let's say, hey, let's do a practice of laddering. But this is kind of a why, why, why method. So if you can have about a half hour of the customer, what you do is you ask them, what is the last thing you purchased? So what's the last thing you purchased at a garden center? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what was the last time you purchased it again. A perennial. A perennial. And why did you buy that perennial? Why did you want it? <laughs> because it's a uh, flower appeal to me and I want to try something different. Okay, so why is it important to you to have something that appeals to you that's different? Wow, that's a good question. Well, I'll tell you, one time we were down at Smith Mountain Lake mm -hmm. and we were at a garden center there and the guy in charge of the garden center said, well, you're at zone six, I don't think I can sell this to you because it's not already zone six. So of course I had to buy it. <laughs> I don't know if you caught that. She was told that this is not zone six. I don't think I should sell it to you. And she goes, of course, now I need to have it. <laughs> he was right. He was right. <laughs> it died. <laughs> but generally, you keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you find out what is the emotional payoff. So for one woman that this method was done, they found out that um, she actually doesn't like gardening, but she wants her um, daughter to come over and spend time with her. And so she, that's, her daughter will come over to garden. That's one of the tasks her daughter volunteers is happy to do with her because mom needs help in the yard. So she doesn't really like gardening, but it's a way to spend time with her daughter. The emotional payoff has nothing to do with that plant. It has to do with family and emotional fulfillment. Someone else, and this is where it gets interesting. So when you're interviewing all these individuals and then you go back to the other one and you kind of compare notes about the different groups, the 30-something is I'm the kind of person who really cares about the planet and I'm going to be an organic gardener. I'm the kind of person who cares about what happens to the food that goes in my family's body, so I want to make sure it's pure, I have all control over that. I'm the kind of person, see the, you know, the continue here? All of it was about a form of self-expression that's extremely different than somewhat like the older group, it was more about a chance to be alone. The younger group was about socializing. The older group was about recharging and getting away from the madness of their, of their life. Those are two extremely different marketing messages. So you really need to understand the demographics of who's buying the plants in your area, in your store. How are we doing on time? Uh, hmm? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. <laughs> so as I was saying, if you notice p um, patterns in the, in the observational study, then you can, can cross-match it here. We also did the survey method, and frankly, this was almost just like a checking, how, how are we doing? So we asked, what do you want from a garden center? And they had a whole bunch of things they could choose from, and then they asked specifically, how do we do each of them? And that went to several thousand people. So you could see, you know, we're, we're looking at different areas. So here's some of the questions we asked. You know, what's important to you? And then how are we doing on that? Is there a particular order to that, or is it all just 
you know, which was the most? Uh, well, it, it changed from group to group. So again, we got the demographic information. So uh, it was important to have, when it comes to the independent, this is true across the board. When people who cared about knowledge, who cared about quality, they always went to a local, locally owned plant retailer. It was convenience. Of course, it's going to be the grocery store or a mass merchant because they're never there just to buy plants usually. They're there to buy other things as well. And I can say someone is, you know, as busy as I am, that's a big appeal, you know. So uh, being active in the community, kid-friendly, you could see where that, would, all, different, all these different things would be. Variety of plants was important, but it's not as important as we as retailers tend to think. You know, we are plant people, not business people. So we, we put, you know, the plant is most important. It is our biggest, you know, everybody knows it's our biggest seller. If you look at all plants as a whole, so we need to increase the sales of that, and that's why they're there at your store. But we tend to put much more, you know, we will ha give you six ways to kill a slug. We'll give you 20,000 rose varieties. And the consumer wants us to actually do some editing for them on that, I think. So, and that's not part of the study, that's just me editorializing, so. <laughs> All right, so what Lakeview learned, this primary customer, family with the parents in their 30s or 40s, the expensive cards were a bust. <laughs> Michelle kept the diary through all of this. It was hilarious. And uh, people, because you had, it was, you know, like um, with a lawnmower where you had the double handle. In order for it to go, you have to squeeze it together and to stop it, you let go. The same kind of concept. People couldn't figure that out. They were dragging, especially the guys, were dragging it through the gravel <laughs> with the brakes on. <laughs> so they had a fire cell pretty quickly after that. They're $500 a piece. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, she had to just admit that they made a mistake with it. The customers were ditching the racetrack path. Okay, for anyone who doesn't know what a racetrack path is, it's whenever you have, uh, like you go through Ikea, they have a racetrack. They take you through the entire store and you kind of have to know the inside ways to kind of cut corners. That's the same uh, concept with the garden center where you take you know, there's a wider path than anything else in the garden center, and it takes you all the way through all the plant yard and throughout the entire store. So they have one here, because the further they go into the store, the more they're gonna buy. So they were finding that there's one location where everybody was leaving on the first weekend. So the next weekend, in between the week between the two weekends, they increased the size of the display there. So they didn't block it if they actually wanted to be there, but it wasn't so visually appealing you know, it wasn't this wider path. So they made it so they can go in that section easily, but it wasn't so obvious a path. And everybody started going to the back of the store after that. So it worked. So this is just a good practice overall. You know, these are things beyond just the, you know, this is just behavior of the customer. They also found out that what motivates the two main customer groups are very different. Oh, and sales training needed tweaking. This was really interesting. They have a product that they're not making money on. It's a $5 starter kit for any, every shrub sold. They want their staff to sell this $5 starter kit. Everything in there is value. I mean, that's wholesale. I mean, it, it is no margin on that at all. It's straightforward. But they do that because just by the customer reading the instructions, putting in the fertilizer, they're watering the plant more. Just the fact that they're you know, taking care, they're not just putting it in the ground and walking away, they have more success. And there's nothing more discouraging than someone had the first plant they buy, especially if they spend money on it like a shrub, than for it to die. And so they found out their, their staff wasn't doing that, weren't really selling that starter kit. So they had an emergency uh, staff meeting where they did role playing and different things like that to train their staff. And their sales on that starter kit went up 65%. Like I said, the sales of the starter kit itself monetarily aren't that important, but it is because then the customer has more success and they're happy and they'll come back to the store. Yes? If the sales from that starter kit were not that critical, I'll put it that way, would it not make more sense to uh, change your pricing on your plants and use that as the, this is our gift to you, you know, that's, that would have been brilliant. What she's saying is that it probably would have been smarter. You, know, you didn't quite say it that way, but, but it probably would have been smarter to add the cost of the starter kit to the shrubs 
so they get it as a gift with purchase. You know, we want you to succeed so much, here's, here's our gift to you. Making sure their, their costs are covered because they're not, you know, this is not a money-making venture for them. That's, that's a brilliant idea. And that's important that you actually add the price right now. Another study I'm working on right now is pricing. And we are terrible about including all our costs when we put plant, price a plant, both growers and retailers. We're terrible at it. Freight is a cost. And it's not a bad thing to include it in the cost. You're not cheating your customer because you're wanting to include freight in your cost. Sorry, you can tell a lot of people do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so I'm probably gonna, because we're probably towards the end here, right? Five minutes? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You can tell I'm not wearing a watch. So thank you, I appreciate that. So that was like looking at your own own store. The other thing is how do we get bigger, you know, more people to come into your store? And you need to get comfortable with spending time with the census, because the census will have information, demographic information about the zip codes in your community. I mean, you can get really granular with what the information the U.S. government has, and you can target communities that you know you want to be attracting, so you, you, know, you can send all of your mailers to that zip code and that type of thing. There's a lot you can learn from that. And hold focus groups. You know, get, buy $100 gift cards and put an ad on Craigslist to get people to come in. And begin questioning them about, you, know, you could choose what area that it is that you want to improve. If you're wanting to do projects that you want to have displays related to that, what are the projects they're trying to, they want to do at their home, what are they trying to improve? You know, there's a lot of different things. Create an advisory panel. I do that for myself. I, I've done that to the beginning of my career. I will, you know, if I have something come up, I have a group of people who've agreed to let me bug them on the phone and say, hey, I, what do, I've got this topic I think we need to handle, but I, I'm not doing what you're doing. What should I do with it? You can do the same thing with customers. You know, get a group that you know will be honest, and, and you have to pick the people, right? You want people who are opinionated, but not people who are obnoxious <laughs> <laughs> and aren't, are so opinionated that they can't see that other people have different points of view. You know, so you, don't, you, know, you want someone who's going to be honest and just shoot from the hip and tell you, tell you what you need to hear. And you can get some really good information. And I would say bring them together at least once a month to kind of get some feedback. Take them to dinner. This is not the focus group. This is not something formal. This is you, you know, being willing to hear people who, who are willing to help you out. There's an HOA offer to work together. HOAs have an amazing amount of power. Uh, this is homeowners associations, for those who don't know what that is. And they have roles like, oh, if you let the grass go brown, you get fined every day it's brown. You know, I'm from Texas, so, you know, there's actually people out there spray painting their, their lawn to get brown that. You cannot have more than three rose bushes in your yard. You know, so there's a lot of people, people who get on HOA boards, and if anybody in here is on one, I'm about to insult you. Uh, a lot of people who get on HOA bar boards are people who are not accustomed to having power in their lives. So they kind of go a little crazy. When I was in uh, college, I worked with the um, Student Loan Association in the summer. I don't know why they did this, but they asked me to organize the annual home and loan association, um, what do you call it, the uh, conference. I'm a college student. I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I'm lining up the speakers. You know, they're giving me the speakers, but I'm calling them and inviting them, and I'm doing the site visits. And I mean, this is way more power than I should have been given. But I was also moonlighting at, at night at Dillard's. And so one day, <laughs> I had to speak to the Secretary of Education for the United States. Get him on the phone with Mr. Secretary. Oh, no, no, call me Bill. You know, very, very nice. I get to work that night. There's this little guy who's the ma uh, manager of the store. I'm, and he's like maybe five years older than me. I'm Mr. Monroe. You must call me Monroe, Mr. Monroe. I was like, OK. People with not much power have more desire to force other people to show them respect. People with real power need to do it. HOA, sometimes you get that mindset on those boards. I think every yard in this should never, ever, ever, ever have a pink flamingo. And if you have one, I'm finding you $1,000. You know, we could only have blue and green as the front door colors. 
you know? Oh, you can only have wrought iron for your fence. There's some silly stuff. It happens with plants, too. You can't have any vegetable plants in your yard at all. It's tacky. You know, so if you actually work with a homeowner's association, I've known a couple of retailers who've done this, they'll have open nights at their um, garden center where 10% of all sales, or, and that's a big, not just profit, but 10% of sales go back to the homeowner's association. They love getting money. So if you work with them, and then you can say, hey, there's, um, here are some things you should know about sustainability, and this is what you know, can really help your community, and you, know, you, you can work with them. It's being po playing poli politics, really, is what it is, but it can make a big difference. So this is what I was talking about, factfinder.com. Go spend some time and, and explore your community. I mean, you need to find out what the ethnic groups are in your community. We're far too white in industry, and we attract far too many white people. We're a much more diverse country than that. And we need to figure out, and again, the focus groups, advisors, all of that, be respectful, try to find out, you know, how gardening is different for some, you know, if you have a large community that has uh, immigrated from Estonia, you know, that, that's the way America is today. We have enclaves from countries sometimes we never heard of until we, we find out that's part of our community. We need to be reaching out to these communities. America's only getting more diverse. Spend time here, and that's going to help you get to know your community. So the good news is, we're an industry made up of independently owned businesses. And that means we are more flexible, we're, we're better able to understand who our communities are. And if we really focus on who they are, all of those problems I was talking about in the beginning, we're all, there's no one answer. There's no one answer. But if you're focusing so much on who your customer is, you're going to be responding to them and you're going to be automatically appealing to them because of that. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.